hello. It's nice to meet you. And Hi, congratulations you. on Belfast. Um, I thought it was an absolutely beautiful film on so many levels. It's one of those that you just want to share with someone else. And I can't wait to actually share this with my family. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to work on the film? What, what drew you to it? Well, like yourself, as soon as I read the script, my family uh, are from Dublin. I'm, I'm a Dublin native, but my dad is from Northern Ireland, uh, Oma, County Tyrone. And where Ken's family would be Protestant working class, my family were a Catholic working class. But they, when I read his script, I just thought he had captured the vernacular of the people. They resembled my family, the, the Donnellys. They, my father and my uncle Jim Donnelly, they always spoke of the great friendships that they had with their Protestant neighbours. So as soon as I read the script, I just thought it was a love letter to a city and it was shining a light on something that we actually don't see often enough about the friendships that did exist in Northern Ireland and the community that exists in Northern Ireland. So many films in recent years may have always focused on the troubles and the violence of Northern Ireland. And I, I like the fact that he was actually reclaiming the city and reminding us of the fact that we're all human. And uh, I, thought, I thought the subtext of the film, the message of the film of you know, treat others as you wish to be treated was a good message for our world today coming out of the pandemic and with all the politics that's going around worldwide. I just thought Surely. it was right up my street. So I, I was really privileged that he asked me to edit it with him. So what was your experience working with Sir Kenneth Branagh? And did you have to call him Sir Kenneth Branagh? No, not at all. No, he's Ken. <laughs> he's a lovely person. I mean, the thing about Ken is he's a master storyteller. He's a highly talented, brilliant actor wrote this script and his script, I, I cannot give enough accolades to his script because the script really was beautiful. It had that sort of mix of the authenticity of the time as well as some magic realism. And he's just a genuinely nice person. So we were working together on Death on the Nile and we actually have done three films together in a two year period. So I've done, I've edited both his passion projects, All is True and Belfast. And then we've done the bigger budget Death on the Nile all within um, two years. So I think the fact of working with him, he's just a most gracious person. And the fact that he wrote the script and it's based on his family. A lot of people have been asking me, was he very, you know, single minded and it was his script and his story. But actually, he was the reverse. His vision was so strong that he was actually able to invite collaboration, not only from me, but from the cinematographer, the costume designer, the production designer. All of us have had the same experience. And I think even you know the actors, all of us are saying we've had the same shared experience of working on a beautiful film in the worst conditions of COVID. But all of us have had the nicest experience of working on this film, thanks to everyone involved. And that obviously came from Ken all the way down, that all of us, it became our passion project. It's his passion projects, but we adopted it as our own because it actually rang true for so many of us who collaborated with him. So this is, is a very personal story for him. So but what does your editing bring out in, in his story and add to the experience? Well, I think I think what I'm good at is I think I'm good at um, always trying to find the subjective point of view in any films I edit. And I always try and find the humanity or some way to construct the film in, with the architecture of shots or the structure, the structuring of the storytelling that could reveal a truth or allow the audience to empathize. So I do think I, that is a strength that I have that I think Ken shares. So when we were cutting the film together, for example, I, I felt if I was cutting something, because we were in two different countries, we were working remotely. So if I was cutting something together as discussed with Ken, and then I saw an opportunity that presented itself, oh, maybe this could work. If Ken had been in the room with me, I would have been able to say, hey, Ken, why don't we try this? But because he wasn't in the room with me, I was then able to do like an alternative version, alternative one and alternative two. And where Ken was great is I could send him the version you know, as requested and then say, and hey, I've sent two other alternatives to see what you think or if anything is interesting to you. If I was sort of looking at any restructuring that might be interesting to him or use of sound or music. So he was um, great at just watching all of those. And if he saw something he liked, he was like, okay. And if he saw something that wasn't quite what he wanted, he'd say, well, no, let's stay as we are. So it was a, collabor a collaboration. And I think that's what I brought to him that I, I, I'm, I was very mindful of the fact he shot it so beautifully with these beautiful tableaus and depth of field long shots. But as a film, you know, you want that sort of movement throughout the film. So there were times where we collapsed scenes and we used music or we changed the ordering of something and maybe it had more of a psychological or emotional effect. So I think we were good, we were good um, teammates. <laughs> and it's important 
you know, for a director to know that the editor can, you have their back, if you like. And if there was something that I thought, is this interesting, that I wasn't afraid to say it to him because he is Sir Kenneth Branagh, but he's also a human being who's trying to make the story. And it's such a beautiful tribute to his family that his, his script was so strong that as we were shortening the film, things sort of re revealed themselves. And it was a very natural process for both of us, despite the fact of us working remotely. It was a very positive experience. It is a, a very subjective point of view, I guess, uh, with the film. How did you approach it? What was it that, how did you get that across through the editing? So first of all, we have the magnificent performances of all our cast and especially little Jude Hill, whose face mm -hmm. in one of the scenes, we just held on his face for the entire scene almost when they're talking about you, know, the Catholics, it was on our side who did that to our Catholic mm -hmm. neighbors. And um, so I think having a bold bravery in holding a shot, that was one, aspect. The other I think is uh, using sound and music as other characters within the film. So the sound design also allowed you in on a subjective point of view. So when the child comes around the, the street at the beginning of the film and then the camera is going around him, Ken shot that at 60 frames per second, but we were able to put a time warp on us. So we began in 24 and we were able to modulate the time. So it went, it ramped down to 48 to 60 to 36 to 48 to 60. So if you watch it again, you'll see that the, the movement swirls in the dizzy reality that he was experiencing. And it goes with the sound design of, you know, the sound is paired back and it's in the script, Ken had written this buzzing noise. So we had tried different things, this element of sound design, which I was doing right at the very beginning in assembly stage before our brilliant sound team joined us just to try and get into the shoes of the child and then the explosion. So I think sound was a very important element of any film where you're trying to explore how it feels to be that person or to be in their shoes. And then when they're hiding under the table, that whole sequence, we, we crafted it with one take, then this circular track that we could put the time warp on. Then it was sort of like elliptical editing with all the smashing of the crates and the guy with the chain. So I went like a magpie through all the A and B camera, finding any little snippets that we could put together, culminating in the black screen where you hear Ma saying, Oh, holy God. So that was sort of like an, an orchestrated sequence all in one go. I heard at one point you were going to have a voiceover. Is that true? And if so, how do you think that would have affected? Because I think it's really amazing that while you're watching this, this doesn't say, you know, through the eyes of a child, but you know it and you feel it in the, the sense of wonder and certain moments. And there's, you know, just your choice of edits. But um, how would a VO have changed the, the film? Yeah, so Ken had a VO in his script and we actually, in August, before principal photography, himself and Harris went to Belfast and they filmed all these beautiful shots of Belfast on their phones. So prior to beginning shoot, Ken and I were able to sort of construct that opening using these phone footage so we could zoom in on them and sort of reframe them uh, because there was a risk that he mightn't get back to Belfast to actually film it because of COVID lockdowns approaching. So in that version, in, in his script, he did have a voiceover and um, an interview and a the Van Morrison was always top and tail. But really rapidly, you know, within three, two, two to three days, we realized the voiceover had a beautiful quality to it, but then the Van Morrison had a beautiful quality to it. And then the interview had something, but it was like an abundance of riches. It was too many things all in the, at the beginning. And then it, it, we tried just the Van Morrison music with the imagery. And then we tried a voice of the child at the beginning and the voice of the man at the end. So we were always exploring what is the best way, but ultimately the voice idea we felt it wasn't actually needed because the voice is throughout the whole film. His fingerprints of his life is sprinkled throughout the whole film. So you didn't need either the voice of the man at the beginning and at the end or the voice of the child at the beginning and the man at the end. It sort of spoke, the film spoke for itself. So we lost that actually, we lost the voiceover at the beginning, even before principal photography, when we did that little four day construction of the opening. So we knew what we needed for the first five minutes of the film. You have these beautiful long shots that really uh, not just establish the setting, but really tell you a lot about these characters, even before the dialogue is spoken or in between the dialogue, you get a real sense for them. Uh, how did that affect, you know, a lot of films don't use those. So how did that affect your approach when, you know, you're, you have this, I don't know, several minute long section without uh, video edits? I thought it was great, actually, because it's like, um, 
Ken has references to older films and I, I was watching last night here in LA, I was watching the 310 to Yuma and I was thinking of you know, those older films and John Ford, that type of simple framing and the mise-en-scene is telling the story, the composition within. So for us, whenever we were cutting them together, the very first week of the shoot, a lot of the takes were single takes, long takes without much coverage. And Ken came in that first Friday of the shoot. To me, I was in London. And he came in after wrapping for the for the day and we watched the first cut down. Now with my assistants, um, Carly Brown and Lydia Manorine, I'd already begun like a sound design template. I had to ask Ken about what sound designs, it was sound memories he had. And he had said, you know, the ice cream van and the rag and bone man and the ship horns and the fog horns and the, um, the trains, constant trains in his area. So we had begun to build that, but it did mean when myself and Ken watched it, it was 20 minutes of the film. And you saw very, very clearly that these tableaus would really work because the performances of Kieran Hines and Judy Dench and the child were just exquisite. But it also showed you that you needed something more to hang your coat on, if you like. So then he began to film more close ups of the boys. And that was a constant dialogue between us as I was constructing it. If there was any scenes which were held you know, quite simply, they really worked, but too many of those in a row, the film ran the risk of plateauing. So then we were looking at, okay, well, maybe picking up some close ups or moving a scene away and putting something between it to try and create a different energy or flow. So that was sort of the, the challenge in the cutting room was to preserve the authenticity of the film, but not to let anything plateau or I'd say it's welcome, become too sentimental. He, he was very keen on keeping the unease so if you watch it again, you'll see some scenes, you know, like when Ma's smashing the cup, she actually left the house, the, the argument continued outside with Jamie Dornan, it spilled out into the alleyway, but we actually cut it there to just keep the momentum of the film, because if it reached a full stop within the film, it sort of let the audience off the hook and then it ran the risk of them not pushing the story forward. So it was something we were very mindful of, but I do think his mise-en-scene and keeping those wide shots, it sort of allowed you as an audience to see it as he remembers it. So for example, one of my favorite shots is when the boy is talking to Pops, when Buddy's talking to Pops in the hospital and Pop says, what do you want? And the little Buddy says, I want you and Granny to come too. And then we have the close-up footage of the child hugging the child, but we cut out the window and you see it through the window as the little child goes to Kieran Hines. And Kieran Hines, you know, he was exquisite. So the, but Jude Hill was exquisite, but Kieran also, when the child hugged him, if you watch it again, you'll see Kieran just took his time before he wrapped his arms around the boy. And that actually just leaves you heartbroken. And we paired back the sound to just the sound of the ocean because the hospital Ken's granddad was in was by the sea. So that was sort of that balance between poetic realism and memory in conjunction with being in the moment with the child. That was, that was our challenge. And that, that's really fantastic when you think about that and how, how lucky uh, Kenneth Branagh is and people who experience that with him because you recreated this and not just told a story, but the sounds and the feel and it's like, it's, it gives me the chills. It's really, uh, it's really just amazing. One of the things I, I was really impressed with was how you balanced these sweeter moments and there's so many of those, but then there's these real moments of big conflict, scary moments, and even like a, a musical, you know, romantic scenes you know even like the, the older romance and the younger romance yeah um how did you find the rhythm for that what you know it's, it's a very natural rhythm actually because i think in ireland and my, my parents are great and my grandparents who you are also from the north of ireland were great oral storyteller uh, tradition people and i think obviously ken's family is sort of the same and when you tell a story but you know, if you ever came to my parents household they could tell you a story and they'd have you laughing and crying and then laughing and crying. And it's like a, a visceral reaction of storytelling. And I think we sort of infused that. It was already in Kent's script, but as we obviously, from script to screen, there's always changes that occur that you have to move with. But we retained, he had it, he captured it on the page. And then we made sure that as we were cutting the film, we kept that movement because it's sort of an important part of the fabric of the film. The, the Irish heritage and not unique to Ireland. It's in many heritages of, you know, when someone dies and you have the wake and the bodies in the sitting room, we bury our dead within three days of death. And normally you would wake the, the person in their home in the sitting room, but the funeral is a celebration of life and there is laughter and tears. And that was a, an important element of the film. So say the everlasting love scene, 
that was really important after Pop's his death to have this emotional release. And for Mom Pa, when I was cutting that, there's so many beautiful shots of you know, the trumpets and the flare of the light and the dance. But we also had to have the subtext, which was Mom Pa coming together because throughout the film, they've actually been at odds and they've been arguing and hanging up phones and the pressure of him wanting her to leave and her not wanting to leave. So that scene took on not only the euphoric release for the audience before we got into the sadness of the departure, but it also brought Mom and Pa together and allowed their love. And we withheld the shot of Jude until the end of the scene. So that you see the scene and then at the very end of the scene, you see the face of the boy and like little Jude, the actor, he was just watching them dance. And that was genuinely his little face when they were doing all that. He couldn't believe his eyes. And you can capture that in the shot. And I, I think that also added to the charm. Had we used that shot early or, or overused it, if we had sprinkled, you know, if we'd planted Buddy watching that scene earlier, we would have lost a little bit of the magic of revealing him at the end, for example. So it was things like that. We were, we were always joking. We were, we were mindful of that as we were cutting. He's something special. He, uh, to have that amount of screen time, but you never saw him acting. He's a real natural. He, he's a naturally talented kid. And Ken gave him very good direction, I think, that at the beginning. I think Ken has said this in, a, in an interview, so I think I'm allowed to say it. But in the first couple of days shoot, Jude was giving beautiful performances. And then every so often, he would just look into the camera lens to make sure the camera had caught him. <laughs> and there's a few still that are in the film. You might spot them if you watch them again. But Ken kept saying to him, hey, Jude, don't look in the film. Just be confident we're filming you. And Jude was like, oh, that was good. That wasn't that good. And so Ken was like, keep looking at you know, mom, pa, or pops and granny. And then where Jude was wonderful was Ken was able to do rolling takes with the, with the child and give him direction, talking over the take as, as the boy was acting. And Jude never lost you know, concentration. And Ken kept saying to him, listen, you know, listen to the scenes. When Pops is telling you something, listen to what he's saying. And Jude did. And I think that's what brought the naturalism. He knew his lines, but he was able to listen and intuit. And if Kieran said anything or you know, a line that wasn't, you know, if, if there was an ad lib or anything, he was able to move with it. He was listening. And that was crucial. So High Noon plays a, a big part of the film. Yeah. Um, was that something that was originally, you know, like how, how did you work that in? Like, so the key elements that Ken had always in the script were, you know, those visitations to the cinema with colour, mm -hmm. uh, the theatre and the TVs and the TV shows. High Noon was always in the script, but Liberty Valance came what, during the edit. The context of that scene with James Stewart saying, you tripped me and it's my fight and you're having my fight. So it was elements like that that I think he was always putting into the TV or into the cinema that it kept pushing the story forward on that subtext level of what it was like to live in Belfast whether it was themes of escape or themes of them, um, don't fight other people's battles or don't create battles that shouldn't exist. But the high noon, Ken had envisioned, I suppose, as, as a child, this heroism of his dad. Mm -hmm. And by seeing the film through the child's eyes and that final sequence with the riot where Pa sets against Billy Clanton uh, Jr., you could just see that he could by playing High Noon, it allowed a sort of a magic realism to come in. So Ken's not saying that that's exactly as it happened, but in his eyes, as a kid who yeah. loved Westerns, that's how he imagined it to be. And that's where High Noon was a vital element. So we planted the seed of High Noon earlier with the guys walking at the barricades, and then it came back uh, for the moment of Pa becoming the hero, the goodie against the baddie. It, it kind of plays like a, like a novel, like a classic <laughs> novel, like Huck Finn or something. You yeah. know, so much of it's through this boy's, you know, his eyes, his his memories, and then, you know, that hero moment. It's it's perfect. It's not heavy handed. It just works so. And you're like, you know, this is the way he remembers it. How did it really happen? It Probably nothing matter. close to this. It yeah, doesn't yeah. matter though. Yeah, it actually doesn't and matter. Actually, and that's a story that will be passed on for generations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That. It's and really I think that's where High Noon actually, what I love about his framing as well, there is a beauty and simplicity to that black and white framing of old. So it does harken back to, you know, John Ford at times or any of that beauty of the framing. And that gives a little bit of license to Ken because by telling it through the kid's eyes, he could avoid all that complexity of Northern Ireland and, and just tell the story so that on a human level, which it would appear has had a brilliant effect because it's made it more universal. People of other cultures and religions can tap into it and actually see something of themselves and their family in this film. So I, I heard that there was an originally an idea to have Kenneth return in the end of the film. Was that, was that taken out with the voiceover? 
or is that that's what's taken out so, you, so there was a, a longer <clears throat> in the original script he returned and then when we locked it in january we actually still had a little hint of someone returning in a close-up profile which revealed itself to be ken and then we have a brilliant producer, Tamer Thomas and Laura and Becca and Kiska from Focus Features and Ken himself. So we were always interrogating the film to make sure it was the best it could be. And I do remember when we locked it, his email Ken to say, despite us having a very tight schedule, we left no stone unturned to make sure that the architecture of the film or the storytelling was top to re reflect his beautiful script, even if it had sort of changed from the script in places. And um, yeah, I think he felt, uh, and uh, you know, as a team, it it brought the film to him. And as soon as he wrote those lines, for those who stayed and for those who left and for all of those who were lost, it actually opened up the film to a wider world. Mm -hmm. So we removed him from the ending. But at that time, it was just him and a poem, a beautiful poem that he had. So we had the voice of the child at the beginning and him just in, in a very you know, obscure close up arriving back. You, you just see it was a man and then a poem, but then we removed that completely and replaced it with the three lines that he wrote. And I think university all of us just thought, yeah, that's that's it, that's the ending. I obviously haven't seen the, that original or that alternate, but uh, what's on screen right now is perfect. The way it's perfect, it's out. perfect. As soon as he wrote those three lines, I think all of us were unanimous and just said, yeah, that's it. It was actually very beautiful him coming back in, in the shortened version, but this was perfect. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did you uh, take on this film compared to other work that you've done in the past? Well, you know what? something unique about it? Stephen, I actually do. I, I give my all to any film I work on, if truth be told. And I think that's why myself and Ken work very well together, because I think he does the same. No matter what film he's doing, Thor, Artemis Fowl, Murder on the Orient Express, Belfast, all is true. He's 100% committed to the story. And, and I, I'm the same. So I did just what I, I always do. I just gave it everything that I could to re, you know, realize his vision and, and contribute to anything that might be helpful to him and keep that sort of balance of poetry alive with, within the body of the film. But yeah, I, I do it to any film. So, but for this film, this film did feel special because it was obviously a passion project for all of us, but we also felt very blessed because we were working during COVID and I'm the only member in my family in the film industry and you know, my sister's especially needs carer for adults with severe disability. And my brothers are in business. And to see family members, you know, really struggling with work, or my sister, a lot of her clients are nonverbal, and you know, COVID was sweeping through the homes. It just, I think we just felt blessed that we were able to, to do something that hopefully will bring a bit of joy to people, bring some you know, humanity to the to this film going experience. And yeah, I I I just think we felt very privileged to tell the story with him in a very simple way, all in our own homes and but working together as if we were in one room. But I, I do, I, I give everything to any film I do, no matter what I do. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, you could tell through the work. Do you have a favorite scene or do you have anything in the film that you kind of worked in that you felt really proud of that you would like to tell people about with, you know, kind of cheat a little bit and, and, and point something out that you worked in? I think one of the, the things that, I, I am sort of proud of is the sequence with Pa leaving after Christmas uh, because I I commute to London. I, I live in Dublin with my husband and two kids, but my work is always in London. So I'm six months of the year in London and I can work from home during assembly sometimes or the kids can come with me or whatever. But it, when I was cutting the film, I did identify quite a lot with Pa and as a sort of an economic migrant. And I said to Ken at one point, what do you think if we were to move Pa's departure to London when he's, you know, the little child is at the window looking out and he's doing that, he's in two weeks, two weeks. If we moved it later in the film, it used to be much earlier and it sort of worked more as a, a feeling of telling the story that he was going to London. But by moving it later, you had much more of a, an emotional reaction because it came after the child said, I don't want to leave Belfast. And then the child is asleep with all the chocolate on his mouth and the Pa is saying to Ma, I don't know if we have until Easter. And then to cut out the next morning and he's on, he's leaving and you know the child has had the tantrum they haven't reconciled which any parent knows when you're leaving at four in the morning and you're kissing your sleeping children so i think i'm sort of i'm i'm very on you know happy and humbled by ken that when i sort of suggest that he listened to that and then 
Ken said, let's try Carrick Fergus on it. And so between the two of us, we then put Carrick Fergus on it. And then it was just like, it opened up a whole lot of avenues and other places of film then that you could sort of say, okay, maybe we could collapse the scene. And with you know, um, days like this, show a little vignette of why Belfast is beautiful, why Ma wants to stay in Belfast, because there was a risk that if you didn't show that side, an audience might get very frustrated with Ma and think, why doesn't she just go? So you had to really show something to, so the audience could empathize with Ma and say, oh, okay, it's not so simple to leave because on days like this, Belfast is fabulous. And the kids are there, the extended family are there, the whole family is together. So things like that, I think I'm proud of. But I'm, I'm very proud of Ken as well, though, because he had such a strong vision and he wrote such a great script that it made him a very gracious collaborator that he was willing to, he used to say, you know, audition that idea and I could put something together, show it to him, then he could decide if it rang true for him, he could include it. And, and if not, we'd say, well, hang on, park it and let's come back to that. Or, you know, he could come back to it a couple of days later. So that, that was a good balance for the two of us to sort of keep challenging each other and, and keep looking at the material to see how, how best we could cut the film and keep it as this you know, love letter to Belfast moving. Again, your words have really made me appreciate the film even more. It's uh, you're you. great, uh, a great spokesperson to, to, <laughs> to, to convey the vision and, and the passion that went into this because uh, it shows, but I, now I, I, like, again, I cannot wait to watch it again. And, Okay, one Thank final you. question, mm -hmm. uh, very simple. Some people hate it, but I'll ask it anyways. You can give me three words to describe the film. Hmm, okay, so this is good. No one has asked me this before, Steve. I would say joyful, compassionate, healing. I like it. Can, can I stick in cinematic? Can I get, Irish people, we have more than three words. <laughs> <laughs> cinematic, how about critical. cinematic heat cinematic uh hyphen healing that's, yeah 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 yeah. exactly yeah when, when when van morrison sang you know, the healing has begun it it was like i think that's that is what he, ken has tried to do you know he's just tried to reclaim belfast and by calling the film belfast i'm really proud of him that he stuck with that because you could imagine you know that mightn't be the case and so i think the healing has begun and if we could all you know work together as you those friendships of the past there's a good hope for the future for the world well thank you again for your time and uh, congrats on the film thank you so much Stephen. Really